everybody. It is episode 411 of This Is Whole Life. And if you are not aware already, this is the 2024 Whole Life Church Retreat Edition. This year, things were a little bit different. Our special guest this year was John Rivers, and normally they will stick around. We have our podcast in the afternoon after the Saturday message, but John had other commitments that he had to be available for later in the day, not at Kalakwa, not with us. And so we actually taped the podcast Saturday morning at 945 at the King Chapel, a little bit different venue for us than normal. Usually it's afternoon in the A-frame after lunch. So a little bit different, but overall it really went well. We had about 75 in attendance, which I think is about average for a crowd at church retreat for the podcast. All I'm going to say is really stop and listen to what John had to say. What a great conversation that we had. He gave a lot of insight. He was very forthcoming and just open with his thoughts and his journey and the similarities between how he has run his businesses, whether that's the Four Roots Farm or previous to that, everyone knows him for barbecue and Four Rivers Smokehouse. And he was a pharmaceutical uh, CEO prior to that. And just the journey that he went on and God still has him on was really, really unique. And there were a lot of ties, a lot of similarities to what or how I think we as a church function and operate. And we talked a lot about those. And so if you've never heard him speak before, he's just got a laid back style. Uh, it seems just genuine, like who he is. And he was just fantastic for the whole weekend. So also in the feeds, you're going to find two bonus episodes. One was from his Friday night talk, which was just really short. I think it was about 12 minutes or so. And then Saturday morning, his message where he expounds on some of the same things you're going to hear here uh, upcoming in just a few moments. So stick around. You're not going to want to miss. John Rivers was our special guest. And this is our podcast from this past Saturday at Camp Kalakwa at the King Chapel. So enjoy. Listen, we're going to get started here with prayer in just a second. And before we get started, um, we're going to do things a little bit differently than we've done in the past just because we're a little bit more spread out. And we only have an hour because we got to get everybody over to the gym before uh, service starts. Uh, so we, we have just the hour. So if you have your phone with you right now, take it out, open up your text messaging app and type in 407 965 one six zero seven. I'll, I'll give you that again a little bit later, but that is Melanie will be receiving the text messages. So if you have questions, comments, things what we heard about last night, things we discussed this morning, then um, just go ahead and uh, text them 407-965-1607. And Melanie will sort through as we have time and, um, you know, we'll get to them and we'll uh, we'll let uh, John take his best swing at those or Ken or Melanie or me, but probably John's your best bet for this morning. <laughs> so let's do it that way. So let's have prayer real quick and then uh, we'll get started. Father God, we come before you this morning and we all have things that are on our hearts this morning. And uh, while we're here at retreat and we're, we're really basking in your nature and in your blessings that we're here. We're together as a as a church family and friends, and uh, we just thank you for this weekend and all that we can gather from it, it to go out and be that church without walls that we desire to be, that your name would be lifted on high. So bless the words that we speak today, and for those that aren't here that'll be listening later, we pray the Holy Spirit would use those words in a way that those ears can hear and understand, and that your kingdom is impacted for it. We love you. Amen. All right, so we'll just we'll get we'll get rolling right away. And the first thing that I thought of was um, how many here have like know about or have been at Four Rivers prior to last night? Okay, so I think <laughs> John raised his hand. <laughs> so because uh, I thought you know there might be some people, and maybe this is more for the people that are going to be listening or that might find the podcast, thinking what does a brisket genius have in common with a church? 
Because that, that, that could be a fair question. And so I did a little digging on the on the smokehouse. It's the 4rsmokehouse.com, just in case you're looking for the website. And I found their mission and purpose, which I was like, did we steal some from them a little bit while we were? I wasn't on that committee. Steve, maybe you can answer that one. Um, but their mission and purpose said, we exist to use our God-given gifts to support the local community through exceptional products, steadfast customer service, and uncompromised integrity. And I'm like, man, that's uh, you know that's pretty good. That's pretty close, and uh, something that I think we can all resonate. And the one of the next sections, I think it was right below that, that outlined their ideals for community involvement. And it said, at the heart of our culture is a keen appetite for contributing back into the growth of the community. And with Roots in Ministry, we're dedicated to supporting those in need. Good food and good people will build a stronger, safer, and kinder community. So I'm like, this really, like, John was the perfect person to come and speak at, re at retreat. And this was a final quote that I found somewhere else on the website that I really resonated with. Uh, John said, this was never supposed to be a restaurant. My definition of helping meant doing what felt most natural when comfort was in order, feed those in need. And when you add those three together, I, I wanted to just start with that because I felt like, you know, each year we try to, and we're talking about connections this year specifically, but we try to make a connection with the person speaking. And we don't always know who that person is. We don't know their history. We don't know their why. And I felt like those three at minimum gave us a pretty good understanding of the why and, and where John's coming from and, um, you know, where, where his heart lies. And so picking up on those, you know, the community support, you know, outside the walls, uh, feed those in need with the gospel, the food. And I was, uh, I went to bed really, really happy last night because not only did I get some of my brisket, my wife was like, I can't eat all this. Can you eat this? And I said, yes, I will. And then my daughter's like, dad, I took too much. Can you have some of this? And I'm like, yes, I will. <laughs> and so, uh, it, 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 yeah, I was a happy, happy person, uh, before we, before we got that. And was anyone else for show of hands? Was who all was here last night in time for, okay. Most everyone, um, John, you can send the brisket recipe to podcast at wholelife.church, <laughs> not dot com dot church. And I promise it'll stay just like between you and me. Okay. <laughs> totally, All right. totally fine. He'll trade you for coffee. There's oh, there, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh so now, there we now go. Now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. Last night was so, so like I was ready for it and I was like relationships. Everything is predicated on relationships and these connections. And I thought, man, is there a place in anywhere that this is more true than a church where what you talked about going that, you know, going the extra mile where people are seen and heard, where they're the, they're the center, you're making them feel special. And I thought, man, we're, we're learning the same thing and we're hearing the same thing and we see that success and, you know, we've seen growth that whole life. What about that experience like from, obviously it comes from a place of ministry in your heart. What started that ministry feeling that made you, I know it wasn't supposed to be a restaurant, but having, what, what brought about that need to feed people and to see that need and to fulfill that need? Well, thank you for the history. I, I appreciate you pulling up everything like you did. Um, if you really want to go back to the roots of it, and, and I'll be happy to share how the smokehouse came later. You know, it's so funny. It reminds me as you're speaking of a, um, a phrase, Kierkegaard, he's a 19th century um, theologian. He said, we, we live our lives moving forward, but we tend to understand our lives looking back. You know, and, and, and everything that happens to us, and I'm convinced absolutely, it's by design. It's by God's will that he's put it together for us. And, and we're going to talk about this later in the sermon, but you know, we, we go through challenges and we go through hardships. And those hardships and challenges are, are intended to get us, make us stronger, to draw us closer to God. And when we do get stronger, he's able to use us more even um, to build his kingdom. So when I was growing up, my family got um, uh, disrupted. 
Um, my folks went through a, a divorce. I had to drop out of college and, and move back home. And all of a sudden, um, I learned firsthand what food insecurity meant. Mm -hmm. And um, from, so we had a, a number of tough years that we went through um, as a family, and I was the oldest of four, but ended up going back to college and only taking classes this semester based on how much money I could save last semester. So it, it took me about six, little, almost six plus years to get through it. And I figured out during the school year, if I joined a fraternity, I could eat at the house. If, <laughs> if I became the president, I could eat free. free. Oh, <laughs> yes, if I became yes. the president. <laughs> but that led a gap, that left a gap in the summer. And uh, I remember, because the house was closed, so there was no access to food. And I remember one day I had a choice. Um, I, always, I always had two or three jobs. I had a dollar seventy-four to my name. And it was either, and I was starving. And it was either get food or use it to pay gas to get to get to work. And obviously I had to get to work mm. and it left such an impression upon me. You know, it's the, those hardships that we have. I, I think that helps build our empathy um, for others who go through it yeah, later absolutely. in life because you, you've walked it. And, you know, I can go into my restaurants and I can and I'll see a group of students say about the UCF store and I can always pick out the one who doesn't have money for food mm. always. And um, and I always feed them. And, and make sure they have something. So it goes back, the, the, the desire to feed, I think, is because God blessed me with the opportunity to, to walk those steps younger in my life mm -hmm. and to truly appreciate what people are going through. I got through college. Um, I, I went into healthcare despite wanting to run a restaurant one day, and I was blessed with a wonderful career, 20 years in, in running a pharmacy and a pharmaceutical company. And um, it was toward the end of it, and ironically, as both my wife and I started going down a, a different journey in our faith walk. And uh, we both grew up Catholic and we were, we always went to church and we knew, I thought we knew a lot about the Bible <laughs> until we started taking, going to Bible studies and learning so much more and specifically learning about the relationship that we can have with God as a father. And, you know, th that hole that I had in the father figure in my life, God stepped in and it was incredibly moving. It was during that walk, and again, things have to happen in sequence. Mm. Had I not been going through that walk, I probably wouldn't have responded when we found out about a little girl who had cancer in our community. And um, we, she was a kindergartner, my daughter was a kindergarten. You, you hear the whole story a little bit later on this morning. But her family wouldn't take money from us, but they allowed us to do a barbecue fundraiser for her um, at their church. And um, we did it, and I absolutely loved it. Hmm. And what it was, goodness, I'm going to tell my whole sermon right here. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are getting a sneak peek. It was, it was taking that passion that I loved, that God gave me of cooking, and it became my work but it, the work was being done to help other people. And people ask, you know, what's the secret of happiness and, and joy in, in a career basis? And it's really, it's not the money you make. And it's, it's not the title. But when you're doing what God made you to be doing, you're doing it as your occupation. And specifically, you're doing it to build kingdom. That's when the stars line up. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's when um, you really, truly find happiness. We started the barbecue ministry. We ran it for four years out of the garage, my wife and I, and uh, we never took money from it. Anytime kids or schools or churches needed money, we would we would host a barbecue for them at their church or wherever it was, and um, we loved it. We absolutely loved it. But that last year got so big, um, we served 40,000 people wow. um, wow. out of the garage. Of the garage. <laughs> we, we, we cooked and we brought it other brought, places. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. So that was the impetus that led to the first smokehouse, which wasn't supposed to be a restaurant. It was supposed to be a commissary. And, and specifically to answer your question, the, the blessing that we had is we actually built a business around a ministry. Hmm. We didn't try to take a business and insert a culture of giving and a culture of ministry, it started that way. And from day one, because we started out of the garage, we never stopped the feeding programs. 
You know, we, we still do that to this very, very day when, when people need help. You know, the, the foundation, the work that we do, is, is, it's there. And that's, that's, matter of fact, I think you heard me say it last night, for years we never advertised for nine years because we didn't have money, <laughs> quite honestly. Um, but we didn't need to. We, we found that we could make greater impact on the community and, and communicate the essence of our brand more by going out into the community and serving and having our people interact and build relationships with the community because mm-hmm. relationships are lasting. You know, uh, uh, a promotion, an ad, a coupon, that's fleeting. Yeah. You know, you'll come in once, but like I said last night, you know, people buy from people and, and people work for people. You know, it's never for a paycheck. You know, you stay where you're at and you put your heart and your soul into something because there's somebody there that is meaningful to you in your life that you look up to or that pours into you yeah. and you truly are appreciative of the impact that they're having in your life. John, you said something a little bit earlier that I I really wanted to see if you could unpack a little bit, but you talked about when you can marry ministry with your passion and turn that into something that you do career-wise that maybe pays the bills, but it's also ministry. I'm sure there's a few people listening to this who are like, how would you even go about figuring that out? How do you... <laughs> How do you do that? I, 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 you know, I need to pay my bills, so I'm doing a job that, you know, maybe I enjoy, maybe I don't, but it's not, not really ministry. So, what would you say to somebody like that? That's like, I hear what you're saying, but what does that, what does that look like for me? What is, what does that mean? Huh. There, there's two, two sides to that. Um, one is don't forego the thought that perhaps God has you where he wants you to be doing ministry work. You know, so often, and it's, you know, it's very common, I'll put church and ministry in one bucket, and I'll put career in another bucket, you know? And, and, and you know, there's, a, there's an old um, lesson that we used to do, and we would draw four buckets on a board, and one would be, this is how you are at work. This is how you are with your family. This is how you are um, Saturday nights. And this is how you are Sunday. And the challenge is, are you the same person in all four buckets? Mm. And if you're not, the, the, the one thing that's common thread between those four should be God. That's the one thing that has enough power to pull those four together. And it's a challenge internally of making sure that I am the same person in each one. Now, now God does call people to, to do ministry, to travel, to go to different parts of the world. And, and that's great if he does. But he calls all of us to build his kingdom wherever we are. And the, the great irony is it's easier sometimes to go halfway around the world to people that we don't even know <laughs> that we'll never see again and talk about Jesus than it is to talk about Jesus in person in the next cubicle Mm -hmm. because you'll see them all the time and they might think something of you. So I always encourage people, don't don't think that you have to forgo everything and give up everything to to go do ministry. The first challenge is, can you bring ministry into where you are today? And the answer typically is yes. Then the second thing is, is, we're going to talk about this later, is just really finding out what that passion and that purpose is in your life, because we all have them. Yeah. You know, and talks, God and talks about it, was it Corinthians? And we all have special gifts that he's given each and every one of us, and talks about it, at, was it Jeremiah, where, you know, he knew us in the womb before we were even born, you know, and, and he, he formed us very specifically, and he did that with a purpose and a plan for us. And um, the analogy that, that I often use is um, God is like a radio station, okay? <laughs> and he's broadcasting across the universe continuously. Never stops, never stops, 24-7, okay? We are the radio dial, okay, our spirit, all right? And he's got a station, all right, that he is 100% hitting. And when our radio dial is off of it, okay, we don't hear him as well. There's more static in our life, okay? But when the radio dial is aligned 
we hear God speaking to our heart very clearly. And it's, it's not God stopping and starting in our life. It's actually us aligning to his word and his frequency to hear it. And a lot of times when I'm struggling or challenged or when I'm stressed and work's not going well, I challenge myself. Where, where am I? Am I asking, am I putting God first, okay, in all of my decisions? And one of the greatest blessings we, we went through, one of the toughest times we went through was when we were opening the smokehouse and we almost ran out of money. And, um, you know, there was, there was a point where we were down to 60 days of cash and uh, my builder had walked out on us and we didn't know what was going to happen. And those 60 day period, you know, I look back and my beautiful wife, Monica, would, would probably not agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, was, it was a wonderful period, even though it was the most stress period in my entire life, because I didn't have anything else to depend on except my faith. You know, what's that all saying? That um, sometimes you don't realize all you need is Jesus until all you have left is Jesus. Mm. You know, and just maybe God takes out all the, the pleasantries and everything so that you have that clear alignment and voice and you hear him more clearly. And um, I, man, I, I spent my days on my knees so much that period. And it was a true relationship because it was a dependency. And um, there are periods when I miss that closeness that I had with my father at the time. Um, and I find when I'm missing it the most is typically when I'm most off kilter. Mm, yeah. And it reflects in my life. I resonated with the, with the radio dial. You know, for those of us that were at least uh, old enough to have to get the fine tuning down just right or find an old coat hanger somewhere to jam in the back of the stereo to get enough and maybe a little tin foil to make that work out, that uh, that really, that's a good analogy. I, I love that. But I, earlier you said when you were, if you start or you when you were thinking about all of this, that everything grew out of this desire to just do what God had for you and then worry about the details. Like we're, we're going to start with this, with this method and this model. And that's a, that's something I think we all kind of know that they're like, that's what we're supposed to do. <laughs> but also, is there anything that you can tell us that maybe worked for, that worked for you and that when you're not feeling it, like you said, sometimes uh, maybe the, the dial's off just a little bit or we haven't figured out yet where that dial is supposed to be tuning to. Well, maybe we might know some of our gifts, but we haven't found a way to actually plug them in yet. I think that's the difficult part. And when we hear someone that has gone through, like it hasn't been all roses, there were extremely t you know tough times and trying times and what would you say to someone who said, "Yo, wow, it's great, John. You, you've you've nailed it on the head. You you hit it. You have been successful. How did what did you do, and how did you stay put, and how did you know that 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 this is what God wanted you to do?" There's there's a lot of uh, pieces in the questions you you just asked me. It's it's typical for me. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Generally, what we do, John, is just pick the one. Yeah, like I that. like that. I like that. That, that was like a menu. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to take number two B. Okay. Right. <laughs> do you want that super size? No. no. <laughs> so it is. It's absolutely human nature. Okay, to try to alleviate risk. Okay, and it's nature for a lot of us to want to control situations to know that that risk is alleviated, if not eliminated. Okay. My contention is when God puts the prompt on your heart, okay, and you know, it's, I, I do very much believe that when you do hear from God and when he does speak to you or when the Holy Spirit touches you, your life will change. There's no way about it, okay? Our job, okay, is to do one thing. It's to say yes. It's not to ask how. I'm not saying it's not human nature. It's <laughs> not to ask proposed challenges. It's, it's not to say I'm not good enough, strong enough. Um, as Moses said, I can't speak. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, one of the greatest 
blessings, okay, that God gave me and gives a lot of us when he puts these challenges on us is not telling us all the detail, which is counterintuitive to what we want. Because if God had told me at that time to help that little girl and to start a restaurant, if he had told me all the challenges, all the heartbreak, <laughs> all the you know, just sleepless nights that we would have endured, I would have cowered. I would have said no. Yeah. And the blessing is he did not. He gives us just enough that we need <laughs> to get through that next step. And, you know, and, and it's like when you're climbing Mount Everest, I tell people, if you stand at the foot of Mount Everest and you look up, okay, you could prepare as much as you want. You could have all the equipment. You could have everything you need. But it's going to be intimidating. Yeah. Okay, And it's easy for us to walk away and say no if we look all the way at the top. I always encourage people, when, when God puts a task that is so big in front of us on our heart, prepare, start at the bottom, but focus on the next ridge. Okay, Get to the next ridge. Now, what you've done is you're one step closer, and you've gained all that experience and strength going to the next ridge. Now go to the next ridge and the next ridge. And you know, one of my favorite things to, to challenge um, young kids and, and people with is a saying that if, if your dream doesn't require a miracle, then you're not dreaming big enough. Mm. And God puts those big dreams on us because he trusts us with those. Well, I'm trusting you with your modesty because you just answered everything I asked. <laughs> so you, you, did, you, took it, you took the whole thing. You took two A and B. Thank you. Melanie, I'm, look, I'm looking at the uh, cell phone you're holding. Is, has anybody written any questions? Yeah, we actually do have a question. Um, well, this goes back a little bit to talking about the radio. Um, there are a lot of channels on my radio. How can I tell which one is God? <laughs> okay. Oh, question. wow. That's a philosophical question. I like that. I go back um, to motives a lot and ask myself, okay, I really want a new car, <laughs> okay? And I can convince myself that this is God telling me I need that fancy new Mercedes that's over there. But I go back to motives. Why? Um, if something is on my heart, is it for my betterment? Is it to make me wealthier, make me look better, or is it to truly build kingdom? Mm -hmm. And I, I push through those. Um, there's a, there's a, a decision path that I use when it comes to career moves, okay, and, and following that passion. There's three things we typically get from a career, okay? We're going to work, we're spending all of our time away from our family, one, because we're learning something, okay? We're, we're pursuing a, a title, a, a doctorate, or pastor, or goal of some type, or we want to be CEO. Number two, okay, we're, um, we're learning, okay? We're doing something that we're passionate about, that we truly care about, that, that brings us life. And number three is because we're getting paid, okay? We're, mm -hmm. we're making a living, okay? Now, you go through your seasons of life, and, you know, by the way, seasons are different <laughs> in our climate for a reason. <laughs> and it talks a lot about seasons in the Bible, okay? It's to tell you, you will go through hot times and you will go through cold times. That's just the way that God built the world, okay? There are seasons in our career that we go through. Sometimes we have all three at the same time, and what a blessing that is. And you know when you're in that season of your career because mm -hmm. you're happy, you're learning, you're achieving, and you're paying your bills. Okay? Sometimes you only have two, and sometimes you only have one. Mm. And I always encourage people that if they find themselves at the end of the day of what they're doing, okay, be it career-wise or not career-wise, <laughs> if it's not learning, if it's not something that they're passionate about, but it's only for the money, it goes back to the motive. No matter how much money you make, you're never going to be happy. You're never going to fill that, 
that void in your heart. And believe me, I was, I led a big company. I was very blessed, but I had a hole in my heart because I wasn't building kingdom and I wasn't doing what I love to do. And I learned firsthand all my life, <laughs> whenever I was you know, growing up, especially when I was didn't have anything, I said, I'm going to be a successful CEO of a big pharmacy and pharmaceutical company. I think I was 42 when I got there and I was 42 and a half when I realized this is not what I want to do because mm -hmm. it was all about the money. Mm -hmm. So the entire six months it took, that uh, was it? No, no, I was <laughs> <laughs> to go. I don't think this is it. <laughs> John, last night you were talking about, and, and real quick, let's, uh, if you have a question, something you'd like to ask 407-965-1607 for those of you that are here live, uh, those of you listening, well, yeah, I guess you could say still it one more it time, in. Randy. Slow. Four. <laughs> Coffee. Zero. Seven. Sorry. Okay. Nine, we, six, we only have a half an hour. Nine, six, five, <laughs> one, six, zero, seven. Actually, I do have another question that came in. Okay. Uh, do you have any stories during your healthcare career that you can share when you felt God was leading you? Mm. Yes. Yes. Um, it was part of that faith journey. Um, God humbled me. And you look back, and now I understand why. I was with um, Johnson & Johnson young in my life, and I was leading a big strategic group for the, the whole company, and it all fell apart. And we ended up taking a pretty big step back financially and by choice, and we went with a small local company. And I went from big corporate America to a small business that was run by Christians. And in my working career, at that point in my life, I truly lived in buckets. You know, I, I had work John, you know, Faith John was very small. Um, you know, Saturday Night John was big and Family John was, was in the middle. And God put me in front of these men who I ended up looking up to became my mentors and they led not just me but Monica and I down our faith journey itself and that's when I started realizing there's there's more to this than just the title the career and you know, the great irony is is that's when I became the CEO <laughs> of the, what was a 188 million dollar company when we started when I got there we were two and a half billion dollars um, seven years later when, when I sold it um, and we took it public. So it, it, had, it all coincided, but it had to do with that faith walk. Wow. So, John, can I change gears on you a little bit? And uh, I just got done reading a book called Unreasonable Hospitality by Will Gadara, which is phenomenal. And I just kind of was thinking, I wonder what tips you might have for churches coming from the restaurant business. Like if you were to, what, as you think about how church goes about doing kingdom work, what could we learn from the restaurant and hospitality industry? What a great question. And there, there's absolute 100% parallels. When you think about it, we, we are in the service business, okay? We are serving, you know, it's funny, we, we serve food <laughs> as a means to enforce our, strengthen our ministry, okay? You guys are serving ministry. And, you know, the question I have is, okay, what is that that's building kingdom? But in both cases, they're both predicated on relationships, okay? And like I said last night, I was telling him I used the wrong word last night. Um, you have to build trust with your guests, okay? And to do that, that means you have to get to know them. And to you, it, it's, it's your congregation. If I'm the leader and I'm the pastor and I sit back and my most important thing is I'm going to have the best sermon I've ever had today and not care about my people, okay, it falls apart. Same thing with us. I could have the best darn menu, you know, I could win all the awards, but if I don't treat my people well and I don't treat my guests well, it'll all fall apart. 
And one of the important things that I keep stressing to our team, okay, we're, we're now getting ready to celebrate our 15th year anniversary. The way we did business 15 years ago cannot be the way we do business today because our guests have moved. And if we're in a true service mode, we have to go to our guests. We cannot expect them to come to us. And that means if the market moves, okay, um, our business used to be all over the counter. Okay? People walking in. Imagine one day it was 100% people walking in eating. Slowly, slowly, slowly it started moving to drive through, to delivery, uh, menu preference, diet preferences begin to change. Today, 52% of my business is not eaten within the four walls. Mm. And if I had forced my business model to stay within the four walls, I'd, 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 I'd lose. The, the second thing that's very important, okay, that we've learned in the process, and I think it's very true to our church as well, okay, the team members, right, the, the most, one of the most important things that we try to instill is passion around our brand um, from guests, okay? You want them to be excited about what they're, they're experiencing. So, because when they go out, you want them to talk about it. You know, there's nothing more powerful than word of mouth from somebody you trust, okay? Something we learned in the process, the level of passion that the guests will have for the brand will never exceed the level of passion my first line team members have for the mm -hmm. brand. My level of passion for the brand that the first line managers will have will never exceed their managers and then me, okay? The one of the most important things to do is to invest in the team members to get their passion to try to match yours as much as possible because the guests will follow from there. So we've actually learn some lessons. We focus so much on customer, customer, customer to try to drive sales. We're changing now. We're focusing on team members. Mm. And the more we pour into team members, the more they'll pour into the guests. So, so how do you do when you talk about the market changing? And I mean, I, obviously you have some things that maybe we don't have in, in lieu of, or in thinking about customers, he said that people walking in was a hundred percent and it starts moving. How do you start recognizing those trends before they get out of, out of control or to the point where it really takes a strong turn to make that happen? Or, or is that the way? How do you happens? not be blockbuster? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a great Could case you, example. You answer that, Could you get a little bit closer to the mic? People want to hear you better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. I have to eat a mic when I talk on these things. <laughs> um, an important lesson we learned too, you, you think about in the a pyramid of hierarchy, okay, in a church or in a corporation, the, the top executives are sitting up here, okay, making all the decisions. The guests, as it goes down to directors, VPs, managers, frontline people, guess. Who's the closest to the guest? My frontline front people. people. Yeah. Who's making all the decisions? The people that are in least contact with market trends. So one of the things that's absolutely vital is we have teams constantly talking to our frontline people. We have actually put committees together, two or three throughout the year. Tell me what you're seeing. What do you hear? And part of it... <laughs> The biggest part, you can take those steps. The biggest, hardest part for most organizations is embracing the willingness to change. Mm -hmm. No, this is the way we've done it. This is the way it's always worked. It's always worked. It's always worked because that's the way the market was. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily translate to that's how it's going to work in the future markets. And it's never, oh gosh, what is this thing? You hold on to what is timeless. You protect what is timeless but you be timely. You, you move to what is timely. Markets will move, customer preferences will move, but what is timeless is who you are, your mission, your values, your purpose. You, you hold on that to that, but how you express those to the guests will change because guest preferences will continue to change. And it changes 
every single day. And we don't realize that just simply because of time. People are aging, okay? My average guest, okay, is, okay, let's just say it's 40 years old. Well, the, somebody who was 40 years old 15 years ago is not 40 years old today, you know? This was, a, a, what, a 25-year-old before. And they have different profit, they have different motives, they have different needs when they hit 40 than my 40-year-old, you know, 15 years ago. So how do you make the 25-year-old happy today? They never happy. And then, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the 40 and the 50 or, you know, how do you make it? Because I, I feel like when, at least as a church, when we start to say, well, we're here to make everybody happy, then it, you know, the terms like, you know, watered down grace start coming in and you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're putting on a production and yet we really do want to minister to everyone. Then that seems to be sometimes a, a, a roadblock that we get smacked with. Yeah. If you think about the speed of evolution of markets, okay, we think it's fast, we think it's fast, but it really takes a while, okay? I always encourage my team, decisions don't have to be a light switch, which means it's never all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, we got to put it, we got to move to drive through. Okay, if we had gone the light switch, okay, I just close front lines, move everything to drive through. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, I'm a fan of you invest a little, you learn a lot. You know, you don't just jump into something. You, you test it and you try it, especially as the market is trending. But I think one of the most important things is you, you protect and you hold on to what is timeless, okay? You know, who the church is, what you believe, right? The basic tenets of the faith should never change, okay? How, and, and, and Jesus taught us that, you go to who needs it the most, and when he brought his word to the people that needed the most, he got to their level. Yeah. You think about that. You know, and, and I think that's, that's vital for any organization to survive. And that's, that's a way to honor the people you're serving. Just like we spoke about last night, when you walk with them, you're at that le their level and you're investing time to understand them. I think that's what I was just going to, I heard you saying was that once you have that trust, you're not going to flick just flip the light switch and, and make it all change today. But also knowing that if you have that relationship, you have the hearts of those that are going to walk alongside you and realize that may, maybe this isn't going to be my season because I don't think I like drive through as much as I like counter, but I'm going to also be patient and, and help, get us to that next point where we all can share a little bit more and I give up a little bit of maybe my preference so that others can be fed as well. You just brought up the best point that, that ties it all together. You don't know what their needs are if you don't have a relationship. Mm, yeah. You can't. You can't sit back and assume this is what the market wants. So John, tell us some of the relationships in your life that you're most excited about right now. Things that maybe that you're doing personally, things you're involved with, things that you're, you're really excited about. <laughs> That'll never change. The that's, 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 that's timeless. timeless. That's, timeless. Yeah. that's timeless. No, actually, uh, I don't want to get into brisket cooking, but we have evolved it over the years. We've had to. Yeah. Cause I went out and I found one that was better than mine you know, about, about six, seven years ago. And I said, dang it. I mean, that's good. Yeah. You know, it, it, it it's okay to, it's, it keeps you humbled. And it keeps you hungry. Oh, no pun mm. intended. Um, <laughs> the things that get me most excited right now is, is you know, the, the business is a blessing. And, you know, it, it is incredibly challenging in today's market to run. I'm, I'm so thankful for the team that I have that, that is running it. Um, our ministry, our, our foundation, <laughs> it's so funny. God, Kat, Monica, and I, we went to Africa on a mission trip. And, gosh, it was... Um, uh, 14, 2014. And we came back and, you know, I get the visa bill. <laughs> there were four of us from our travel and from our travel to the clothes that we had to get so that we looked like we were in Africa to the ministry work to everything else. We spent, I mean, the, the amount of money that we spent was an ornament. And I asked Monica, I said, how much of this went to the mission? <laughs> you know, it really, it didn't. And I, I said, there's got to be a better way of taking our resources and making a difference. And we prayed about it. We said, okay, let's, let's take all of our foundation work and focus it on a local level where we think we can go deep instead of going wide. 
And, um, you know, no surprise, we went to Orange County Public School and said, where do you need help? And it was in the cafeteria that I walked and I saw the kids that were hungry <laughs> and that weren't eating. And I saw what was on their plates. And now you understand why he tied it back to um, my food insecurity. When I saw this was happening to them, it moved. It, there was no question about it. This is where we wanted to help. Um, that initiative of feeding kids that started in 14 quickly began to realize that we're giving kids this fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, but they don't know how to cook it. Their parents don't know how to cook it. It's getting thrown away to an appreciation of we've got to teach people about the importance of the creation story and where food comes from, <laughs> how God's blessed us with the abundancy and the responsibility of taking care of the planet so that we can continue to feed ourselves. And we started an initiative um, back in 2015. It led to it. God said, build a farm. And um, I, remember, I remember literally in my prayer journal, I, I write when, I, when I'm, I'm in my devotions, I said the same thing to God then that I did 10 years later, earlier, when he said, go start a restaurant. And I said, I'm not a restaurant tour. This time I said to God, I'm not a farmer. And he reminded me, you weren't a restaurant tour oh. <laughs> either. Oh. And um, so we started our Four, Four Roots Farm project. And it was just a vision and a dream back then to see what we could do to teach kids where food comes from. And I don't say that lightly. We're surprised continuously how many kids we learn um, in our meat, in our community that don't know that a tomato comes from the ground. And it's, you can't blame them. Right. You know, we're, we're the ones that are blessed. And, you know, with that blessing comes the responsibility to teach and to nurture. So we shifted from handing out food to let's build a, a farm that's a campus where we can teach kids, students, families, professors, um, health care providers, farmers, all about that beautiful harmony that God intended us to have with the land and with the planet. And um, I, that project <laughs> got out of hand. <laughs> it's, uh, it's 40 acres that God's blessed us with and them two miles outside of downtown today. It's a farm campus. It's on John Young Parkway. And uh, it's a $65 million project that back in 2015 and 16, I was saying, God, you know, I sell some brisket, but not quite that much brisket. <laughs> um, and again, you know, not telling us all the details, you know, just, just saying yes. And I keep going back to that. The most important thing when God touches our heart is to say yes to that. And he has shepherded us. Um, he's, given, he's taken care of us. We've, we've raised over $32 million of it. We're building this big, beautiful facility. We started feeding programs in 2020 where we go to our farmers, where all this food goes to waste. We collect it and we go back in the community and we hand out fresh produce to pockets of the community that don't have access to it. Last year, we handed out 2.4 million meals um, to kids wow. that, that don't have it. Um, we work with 52 farmers. We, we keep them in business by buying their produce. We're building this facility. There's, there's, I could go on and on about the farm. But to answer your question, that's where God has moved me. Um, I'm the CEO of both organizations, and it's, it's getting a little tight, uh, <laughs> strapped. But my heart is, you know, and it's so funny that I, I used to think that God gave me charge or trusted me with charge of the smokehouse as that was going to be the ministry point. And it was a realization that was the stepping stone in order to build the farm that has a much, much, much greater impact. Where do you see that farm going in the long term? What's uh, what's your, what I, you know, to me, you know, feeding that many meals is, is a huge accomplishment on its own. And I, and I think that people probably don't appreciate how much food insecurity there is in Orlando itself. And I pr think that we probably don't, uh, many of us 
uh, I grew up in in a kind of a more rural setting, so we had a farm and it wasn't bec- or we had a garden. And it wasn't because we just enjoyed gardening. It was it was an important supplement to what we were eating when I was growing up. But you told a story at one of the um, breakfasts that I was at that I t- about uh, handing out the or handing out vegetables in an urban area, and there was I believe a, a student who kept saying that his parent threw away what they were sending home. Can you tell that story a little bit and tell what your big picture of what you're trying to accomplish here? Because it, it goes beyond just creating it does. Ve- vegetables. It is. Because we used to just hand out meals, right. hand out food. And um, Dave Krepko, who used to run Second Harvest, retired. And I asked him what he learned in his 12 years of running the food bank. And he told me, John, he got very solemn. He said, I learned that you can't food bank your way out of hunger. Mm-hmm. And I said, what does that mean, Dave? He said, we're handing out more food today than we ever have in our history. Yet missed meals in Orange County is at an all-time high. Wow. And it made me realize you can't just hand out food. And then that really, almost at the exact same time, the story that you're speaking about, we used to send a lot of produce, and we still do, send a lot of produce home with students. And one of the teachers asked, I was a little girl, um, you know, how did you like, and I forgot what it was. It could have been broccoli, it could have been lettuce. How did you like it? And uh, the little girl says, well, my mom threw it away last night. So she sent some more home with her. And she asked the little girl the next day, well, how'd you like it? And she said, my mom threw it away. And it happened to be timing-wise, the parent-teacher conference was coming up. And this poor teacher, I remember she was nervous. She was telling me the story about addressing the mom. Uh, but she did. She says, you know, we, we sent some food home. And do you mind if I just ask, you know, your daughter said you threw it away. And do you mind if I ask why? And the mom looks at her very incredulously and says, well, my daughter told us it came from the dirt. It came out of the dirt. We're not going to put anything in our mouth. It came out of the dirt. And it changed our perspective on how we need to go about this. You know, access alone is not going to fix the food insecurity issue. It's access plus education. We have to be able to teach them about it. And I'm convinced there's a third leg and that's inspiration, mm-hmm. okay? I could give it to them, I could teach them, but I have, and it's the same thing for ministry and church. <laughs> As you say, it sounds like the... But I have to get them excited about it. I got to inspire them to want to learn more. And uh, it changed our perspective and the, the food insecurity, the food issues that we face, not just as a county, and in, in our county, just in Orange County, one in five kids live in food insecurity. Okay, that's 20% of our students in public schools today and I asked Barbara Jenkins, the superintendent at the time, what does that mean? She says, That's, these kids, this is the only food that they eat typically all day long. And I said, what about when they go home? She says, there's not a guaranteed meal. And I started saying, what about the weekends? That's not it. We're not talking third world, okay? We're talking our backyard. 20% of our kids don't have food when they leave school. And it, it hit me so hard right between the eyes. This is where we need to work. But then you start peeling back the onion I mean, there's so much to what's called a broken food system. The produce that you ate this morning, you know, the beautiful strawberries and grapes and stuff, they didn't come local. You know, in America, our average produce travels 1,782 miles to get to our plate. Okay? That comes from all over the world. As a matter of fact, as a country, we are now importing 52% of the produce we consume comes from other countries. And then you ask the question, why? Why? Are we, do we not have enough farmers? truth of the matter is, every week in the United States, on average, 258 farms close. Okay? Close. Every time we import something from somewhere else, we take it away from a local farmer. And those local farmers, okay, they're families. 86% of the farms in the United States are owned by families today. And then you ask the question, okay, is, do we not have enough food being grown in the country, let alone just the state? And the stat that got me is that we found out that every year in the state of Florida alone, and this is not indicative to only Florida, okay, this happens in other states too, there's almost, there's almost one billion pounds of produce that goes to waste in the fields, okay, that never comes out and never makes it to the plate every single year. There's more food that goes to waste in the field 
than is needed to feed all the kids in the entire state. And that's what's called a broken food system. So that's what you know, we started to really dig in on, <laughs> excuse the pun, <laughs> and you know, see how can we create a solution. And you know, it is, it's a huge, huge national problem. I remember somebody in the beginning when I was explaining this to them, because you know, it started with that passion. God put on my heart, here's a challenge. And again, it's a huge problem. They said, you can't, you really think you're going to change the country? You think you're going to change the world? And what I came to, the resolute is, I don't have to change the country. All I have to do is change my community. And if I change my community, maybe mm -hmm. I'll inspire other communities to follow and do the same. And quite honestly, maybe they'll even do it better. Okay, we've got about just 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 over five minutes. And yeah, I see I, Melanie's uh, anxiously I, looking at the I, phone. Questions coming in. I want to at least get to get to a couple. Um, one is, uh, and I, I I hear overtones of also church in this. You know, hospitality and church possibly. But how do you prevent yourself from being from trying to be all things to all people? Mm. <laughs> That's great. That, that, that's a great question. Um, you can't. You can't. You, you got, you know, God, <laughs> okay, so God gave some people a gift of being pastors, some of them um, healers, doctors, some of them uh, benevolent. Some, oh, no, he didn't give all of us, anybody, all the gifts. You know, I, I, I contend you, you pick the one thing that to be great at, okay, and you be great at that. What was that book um, Stephen Covey wrote years ago? And uh, he had examples of businesses, okay? Some of them he called foxes, I think, and some of them were hedgehogs, okay? And a fox is good at a lot of things, okay, but just a little bit, okay? A hedgehog picks one thing and they go deep in it and they become the very best at that. And I am of the firm belief you pick the one thing and you will make a bigger impact by being the best at that versus a little of everything. So in our business, we said on the restaurant side, we do barbecue, we do brisket, and let's build on that. Okay. On the ministry side, you have we had to pick. Okay. We can't we can't serve which gosh knows there's there's no shortage of needs. We just can't do all of them because we get we would be ineffective. So as a committee, as a team, we chose, okay, here's four or five that we truly believe in. You know, it's ministry, it's education, of no surprise, it's food insecurity, okay? And let's go deep in those. And it's the same principle on the farm. You know, fortunately, the farm has evoked so much community support. You know, the problem is so big, we could never take it on ourselves. The blessing has been because food insecurity touches so many areas, our list of relationships <laughs> and partnerships is so deep and so vast by us being the courier of the message, okay? If, if, if even everybody here today, you don't get involved in the farm, it's okay. At least maybe today you learn something about what's happening in our community that provokes you to do something in the community. Mm. By just be being that courier, we have pulled together so much support from these wonderful organizations and people that are allowing it to go to happen. But, but we're choosing specifically, okay, you fix a community, all right, you need better schooling. Uh, you need housing, okay, you need rent relief. You, need, you can't do it all. We do what we do. We try to be the very best at it. And we form alliances with the other organizations that are doing the other pieces and collectively will make an impact. Do you have one more for us, Melanie? I do. This actually relates to last night. This person really enjoyed your, your message last night, um, especially the part about uh, hospitality and going the extra mile. Uh, how do you go the extra mile for a difficult person? <laughs> mm. I, I, I would encourage um, two sides to this, okay? Our calling is to be forgiving, okay? To be empathetic, 
um, and to do everything that we can to try to help, okay? It's not our calling to fix somebody or to change somebody. Mm -hmm. And I tell our team, you take every step to be honoring and do what you can. And at the end of the day, there are just some people who want to be unhappy or want to take advantage of the situation. And you just, you tell them, thank you. You tell them you love them. And it's okay to let them go. It's not our responsibility to change that. But the one encouragement I do give our team um, when they are dealing with difficult people, because you, you never know um, what the situation is, what they walk in with, and they can be facing challenges and problems that, you know, momentarily that are even greater than ours. I always encourage people, look in their eyes and try to find Jesus. <laughs> Look for that beautiful child that's behind that anger, that rage, and see what it is that God sees in them, okay? And then treat them like that. Um, I said that last night, is, is people will, will respond and rise up or go down to the way that you view them. And if you view them with love, you know, they've got a great chance of rising up to that. If you write them off, you know, They'll never have that chance. John, I just want to take a, a moment here just to say thank you for being here this weekend. Uh, last night, we we thoroughly enjoyed your talk. We're looking forward to, in a couple minutes, having you speak to us again. And I've thoroughly enjoyed the podcast and what you've shared with us today. If people want to know more about the farm, where do they find that online? Oh, that's great. It's on the number four, rootsfarm.org. Uh, for, for the number four roots.org. Yeah, we're real creative with the number four. <laughs> we no, know. yeah, yeah, no. And the, and the, the smokehouse is for our smokehouse. Hey, there you go. What do you know? So There's four of us in our family. <laughs> ah, yeah, I did, uh, I did notice that there was a, a fun fact on the website of why four rivers. You want to tell everyone real quick? We'll close with that. Sure, sure. It actually goes back to Genesis. Um, aside from there's four rivers in the Four Rivers family, there's a passage in Genesis um, 1 that talks about from the Garden of Eden, four rivers will flow hmm. and how those rivers help and bless so many other nations around. Oh, man, that's Beautiful. awesome. That's a great connection point. And so thank you guys all for coming today and for sending in your questions and for joining us. And uh, for those of you that will listen to this later, eh, we were hoping you'd be here, but you weren't. So we hope you enjoyed this message that we had this morning in next but, year. But they were here, Randy. Well, kind of. They were here. If and, they were listening, they were kind of here. And don't miss next year's church retreat. If you can be here, you. be here. Yeah, because yeah. you never know. It might be someone cool like John Rivers that shows up to speak and hang out with us again. Well, hopefully cooler. <laughs> <laughs> John, there's nobody cooler than you. Come on now. All right. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, we're going to move on. And uh, what, church is next over in the gym at 11. So you've got a couple minutes to uh, get ready and connect. move that way. You can connect, connect with somebody. Thank you, John. Bye.